Καταρχήν να, να συγχαρώ τη, την πρωτοβουλία α, όταν μας κάλεσε ο κύριος Χρυσουλάκης να, να συμμετάσχουμε σε αυτό σαν, σαν εταιρεία με όλου του τρόπου που μπορούσαμε ήταν αδύνατο να, να αρνηθούμε. Η οικογένειά μου έχει κάνει ένα κύκλο ακριβώς 100 χρόνων φέτος από το 1922 μέχρι σήμερα ξεκινώντας από τη Σμύρνη πηγαίνοντα στο Κάιρο, στην Αθήνα, στο Βουκουρέστι σε πέντε χώρες της Νοτιοανατολικής Ευρώπης με απευθείας παρουσία με προσωπικό και ελπίζω κάποια στιγμή να κλείσουμε τον κύκλο και να βρούμε το θάρρος να κάνουμε κάτι πίσω στην χώρα που σήμερα λέγεται Τουρκία. Μέχρι στιγμής δεν έχω βρει εγώ προσωπικά, η δικιά μου γενιά δεν έχει βρει το, το θάρρος. Αλλά οι παππούδες μου ξεκίνησαν από τη Σμύρνη και κάναμε αυτό τον κύκλο. Επομένω, ω Έλληνε τη Διασπορά, που σαν εταιρεία ανδρωθήκαμε, ξεκινήσαμε και ενηλικιωθήκαμε στο εξωτερικό, γυρίσαμε στην Ελλάδα, αναπτυχθόμαστε αυτή τη στιγμή και στην Ελλάδα. Πιστεύουμε πάρα πολύ στην Ελλάδα και στο momentum που έχει. Και θεωρήσαμε ότι είναι υποχρέωσή μα να είμαστε εδώ και να υποστηρίξουμε αυτή την προσπάθεια. Και να συγχαρώ και το Αριστοτέλειο και το Πανεπιστήμιο Θεσσαλονίκη για το θάρρο που είχαν να ξεκινήσουν και το πρώτο ξενόγλωσσο πρόγραμμα. Γιατί αυτό πιστεύουμε ότι θα πάει μπροστά την Ελλάδα και ελπίζουμε στα επόμενα 7-8 χρόνια. Όταν επιτρέψει πάλι το Σύνταγμα, να μπορέσουμε να έχουμε και επιτέλου και ιδιωτικά πανεπιστήμια, ιδιωτική ανώτατη εκπαίδευση στην Ελλάδα και να ανοίξουμε τι πόρτε μα για όλου του φοιτητέ που το ζούμε εμεί, κοιτάνε την Ελλάδα, θέλουν να έρθουν στην Ελλάδα και απλούστατα δεν μπορούν. Αλλά η προσπάθεια που γίνεται αυτή τη στιγμή με τα ξενόγλωσσα προγράμματα στα κρατικά πανεπιστήμια θεωρώ ότι είναι πάρα πολύ θαραλέα και σα χαίρω και πάλι. Το δεύτερο που ξεκινήσω είναι να κάνω ένα disclaimer και μετά θα γυρίσω στα αγγλικά. Δεν είμαι ειδικό. Συνήθω οι άνθρωποι που μιλάνε για τεχνολογίε στην ιατρική επιστήμη και εφαρμοσμένη ρομποτική και digital technologies είναι either, είτε engineers είτε γιατροί. Εγώ δεν είμαι ούτε engineer ούτε γιατρό. Επομένω, συγχωρέστε μου την άγνοια και την μη εντρίφηση στα, στα φαινόμενα. Θα προσπαθήσω να κουμπίσω και να μοιραστώ κάποιε σκέψει για το τι συμβαίνει αυτή τη στιγμή στον κόσμο. Και ξεκινάω με την ιδέα του democratization και η ιστορία που λέω συνήθω είναι η ιστορία μια φίλη από, από τη Φλόριντα, από το Μαϊάμι, η οποία έχει μερικά uh, premium, uh, θα γυρίσω στα αγγλικά, owning some premium restaurants in, uh, on, in the South Beach. And she was always telling me that 10 or 20 years ago life was very simple. If they wanted to promote a, a restaurant, they would simply hire a Hollywood actor, they would pay him some money, and then they would invite the press to be present there in the restaurant. Next day in the morning, there would be some pictures, some TV news in specific media, TV, the newspapers, and the magazines. And everybody would say, this is the best restaurant. Let's go there. And things were safe and under control. Once social media popped up, you could never simply know who's entering your door. There might be some young 16-year-old kid entering and having a dinner. And if you don't serve that kid, you find out the day after that she's an influencer. And she's having something like 100 million followers. Uh, on Instagram, and if you don't serve her well, your business is totally uh, disrupted, it's totally in, in, in a big, big trouble. So the fact that social media and the interconnectivity of the world allowed people who are not the big names, who you don't simply know, have access and influence on, uh, on, the, on, the, mass, uh, on the mass public, has changed the world. And this is a typical example of democratization And let's see how this will uh, influence and how this is what is happening in uh, the rest of the world. Just a vital few on, uh, on robotics and to make sure that everybody is aligned here. Um, just a very, very small intro. When we're talking about surgical robotics, we're not talking about a robot replacing a surgeon, replacing the man. We are talking about a system and technology enhancing the capabilities of a man, enabling the surgeon to do a better job. So instead of laparoscopic uh, surgery, where uh, traditional handheld uh, instruments were used, or open surgery that we all know, now we have a surgeon sitting on a console using some pedals and some joysticks, uh, we can call them like that, and transfer his movements and his vision through pixels uh, into a system that is doing uh, the job ensuring a better image, a 3D image, and a 10 times magnified image. So practically, we get to ensure precision, recovery, and better clinical outcomes at the end of the day by using technology and giving the surgeon uh, the possibility of uh, doing more than nature has uh, given him to. And the best example that we can use here, and it's something that uh, Steve Jobs was always using for the power of computing, um, is the bicycle. And there was a, 
uh, a contest made actually between the energy that a man versus a condor needs to get from point A to point B. And of course, the condor was needing less energy for uh, getting from point A to point B. But if you give the man a bicycle, the man becomes more efficient than the condor in terms of the energy spent for getting from point A to point B. Practically, we are talking about man becoming the tool maker and um, the tools giving him the ability to use a certain part of the human intelligence um, and enhance a certain part of the human intelligence, the mechanical part, so that the man can focus in the creative part. This is all about surgical robotics at the end of the day. That was a small intro of what we do. In terms of geography, this is where we are. We are nowadays active in five countries with direct operations. We started from Romania, and the group is already is still headquartered in Romania. And we have direct operations and the responsibility of carrying our technologies, 25 different technologies, including uh, Da Vinci and robotic surgery, into these five countries. And we have a plan to expand further in the region. In terms of installed base of the robotic system, just an update, there are 13, 3, 3, 11, and 12 systems. And we have also a split between the public and the private systems. Um, so in all countries, usually the public and academia is going ahead and they're opening the way, being more curious of uh, embracing new technologies. So we see this in uh, Hungary. We just uh, two years ago, we opened the market of Hungary and we have three active robotic surgery programs in the top university hospitals of Hungary. Romania, Bulgaria, there is a uh, reasonable split between uh, public and private. And here's Greece. So blue is private and red is public. And I will not criticize. Uh, we've been in Greece for uh, 20 years now. So the technology was adopted by the private sector. And uh, there is one single system in the public sector in the oncology hospital of Metaxa in Piraeus. Uh, for some reason, the public sector has not uh, adopted yet this technology, I will allow you to draw your conclusions. Um, we believe that we can, we can, um, we are facing actually, we're using um, a paradigm uh, shift in, uh, in healthcare. And we believe that we are just getting started. So uh, robotics or even any type of minimal invasive surgery is not yet the standard of care. Um, there is a huge opportunity for, uh, for robotics. And we see that as surgical procedures are utilizing data, they're increasingly utilizing more and more data, they will increase clinical efficiencies, they will assist in decision making, and they will automate, uh, like uh, our, my predecessor speaker was talking about, specific tasks. So the, the robotics task will play, we believe, a key role in meeting the needs of the healthcare systems and the patients very, very soon. And we might be talking about e-patients, e-physicians, and smart hospitals all, uh, already. There are already um, experiments and uh, trials on uh, remote uh, teleoperations. Uh, 5G networks are a pure enabler. So we can already see that um, with the capabilities that we have now, surgeons will be allowed to, to collaborate, to collaborate globally between them to enable greater access uh, to expert treatments, so being able to have uh, exchange of experience and being able to pick the brains of one another regardless of where they are. And of course, we'll allow them to reach very soon remote and unprivileged populations. And I will get back to that at the end as a democratization um, uh, benefit or effect. Um, so the leveraging the data, the visualization, the intelligence and the devices, they will provide the real-time guidance during the, the procedure. And uh, I think this will help also on the surgical planning, the post-operative, and the procedure optimization. Uh, for example, we have now the data and the metrics, and we can collect them from the procedure and provide feedback. So a surgeon can uh, look into his procedure and the data that he can, uh, he can collect and um, can uh, draw conclusions about improving his, uh, his next operation. And I, we believe that this will practically ensure access to a different uh, quality, a higher quality of care. And at the end of the day, uh, nobody, we believe, will resist to what is best, uh, best for, the, for the patients. Um, having those ergonomics, the visibility, and the ability to treat patients with this, with this type of precisions 
we believe that very soon it will be difficult to imagine surgery without uh, robots in the not so distant uh, future. Um, practically, we are we are getting a, a digital transformation in healthcare. And what is happening is that we are having a different type of diagnosis. We have a technology-enabled diagnosis, technology-enabled treatment, and the monitor of the patient. So we are diagnosing the patient, we are treating the patient, and we are monitoring the patient using uh, the technology. And this is what we call the digital transformation of uh, healthcare. And this is happening prior to surgery, while we are preparing for the operation using all the imaging that we have and the information. During the surgery, having online real-time, the imaging that we need and the information that we can uh, we can collaborate and we can uh, provide the, the surgeon with, and the follow-up after the surgery. Practically, the golden triangle of healthcare between the best outcome, the best clinical outcome uh, that we need to, to get medically, uh, the experience, the journey of the patient, and the total cost are being met, plus one factor that sometimes is neglected, the experience of the surgeon the experience of the healthcare professionals, because sometimes we tend to neglect how much they can resist. And uh, by the lack of uh, professional staff and uh, experts that we have in the world, you know, there is no, no country that has enough doctors, physicians and nurses in the world nowadays, not even the richest one. The fact that we are enabling them to having a better life and to last more and have a better quality of work, I think is also a very, very key point. So from the triple aim, we think that with this type of digital transformation, we are also hitting the quadruple aim. Um, one thing that became clear also for us while using the technologies, and especially the, the, the surgical uh, robots, is that um, besides a tool and an enabler, this system practically is a creator of pixels. It's a generator of data, like uh, uh, the gentleman before uh, was very nicely talking about. So we, we were imagining that a surgeon is sitting on the console. Every movement that he's doing before being transferred into the, bat, into the anatomy of the patient is becoming pixels. And every picture that the endoscope is, is capturing before getting into the 3D, 10 times magnified vision of the surgeon, is pixels. If we take those two pixels and uh, those two streams of pixels and we analyze them and we get to the point that this famous black box will be analyzing uh, wisely the, the information, uh, we have a wealth of data that can really transform uh, uh, healthcare. For your information nowadays, a surgeon uh, can see his uh, uh, data on an app. There's an app, there's an application on their smartphones that they can check their performance, they can see their times, they can see uh, the moments that they had some uh, maybe some challenges during operation and they can benchmark themselves with clear statistics exactly using those very pixels about how they have been progressing through the years, and they can benchmark themselves with their peers in the region or all over the world. So this is about real time, and this is, this is happening as we speak. This is about the real time um, uh, possibility for a, for a physician knowing how he stands and how he develops. I think this is, this is priceless for, uh, for, their, um, for their evolution. And besides the, this digital link with themselves, there is also a digital link that is, uh, that is connecting them with the patients because the patient can have access to, the, to some of this data. They can share information, they can share pictures, uh, images, and um, practically we can imagine a world where the surgeons, uh, the hospital, the hospitals and the technology providers, they can harness whatever AI and machine learning can uh, give us nowadays and can bring better outcomes for the, for the patients, personalized, customized training for the surgeons, and of course, let's not neglect lower cost for the hospitals. Now, to the, to the question if AI is better than humans in healthcare, we don't know if it's better, but we know that it can make humans better in healthcare. And uh, the point here is that we know uh, for sure that uh, machines are better already in recognizing patterns because uh, for the ones who are not experts and haven't practiced medicine here the few ones i guess here in the room um, 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 diagnosis and uh, and healthcare at the end of the day medicine is about recognizing patterns and machines uh, have been have become already better in recognizing patterns from one single source 
but imagine how better they can become and they are becoming in recognizing partner patterns from multiple sources. Because we can have uh, CTs, we can have X-rays, we can have ultrasound, MRIs, uh, lab tests, uh, conversation with the patients, um, the, the record of the patient, the, the electronic medical records. So if we take all this and the more information we have, the more difficult it is to process them. And we put them in this famous black box. Um, we, can, we can be sure that the machines, as they're getting better, will be drawing better conclusions than a human mind can uh, draw. And the machines don't get uh, tired. So they can be really being a great enabler for, uh, for the surgeons anytime, any day. Um, practically, we're developing the AI and the machine learning, and we're using the robotics in order to to ensure um, actionable insights. And, uh, uh, and it's a virtuous cycle. We believe it's a virtuous cycle when, when we focus into the, into the training and to the, uh, to the um, uh, practically nourishing, allowing the machines to, to collect, to, to create data. And we collect the data and we draw conclusions. It's practically a virtuous uh, cycle. We are harnessing the power of the data. We are analyzing. Uh, we're analyzing them, and what do we create? We create conclusions for the surgeons, for the care teams, and, uh, and the patients. And exactly this loop is what we have tried uh, ourselves as a group to nourish with uh, Isle Academy. Isle Academy is our innovation, simulation, and learning ecosystem uh, centers. We have three ones, two, uh, one in Athens, one in Bucharest, and a mobile in Bulgaria and Sofia. And we are uh, thinking of uh, opening another two. Uh, practically, the title there is a training surgeons like pilots, allowing the surgical teams, not only the surgeons, getting their time, having a simulation of an OR, a place where they can sit with our systems, they can take their time, use the technology, and either learn new skills or simply prepare for a complex operation. So we had several cases where in view of a hepatectomy or a partial nephrectomy, a team of surgeons would uh, get there, will take their time uh, and uh, on domes and specific uh, exercises will prepare in order to run for a first time a very complex operation the next day in the hospital in real life as prepared as uh, as possible. Um, we 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 really uh, take pride in uh, in uh, giving them this uh, this possibility, and as we are proudly proudly say, this is the least thing that we can do and give back to the medical community that is trusting us by using our our technologies. Um, Closing and uh, concluding and uh, getting back to the to the democratization uh, thing, um, I see overall this uh, democratization process on three different levels. It's the, the patient level, the medical community, the physician, surgeon level, and the healthcare systems or health, um, uh, health or national health systems uh, programs. And I think when we start about the patient, uh, the best example is the one uh, that was mentioned before by IBM Watson. I was shocked. It was almost 10 years ago when the first uh, study was published for um, four centers, one from, uh, from the US, one from Japan, another one from Canada, and the, the fourth one from Europe, um, where compared the, um, uh, the, the outcomes on uh, specific lung cancer cases were compared from, uh, by this multidisciplinary tumor board versus the, uh, the algorithm, versus this uh, Watson uh, um, analysis. And on the lung cancer, it had reached back then, 10, 10 years ago, 86% accuracy. And people, of course, were looking on the dark side and they were saying, okay, what happens with these 14% of patients where the algorithm was wrong? Because yes, when you have 86% accuracy, this means that you failed at 14% of the patients. And then the, the discussion at that conference exactly 10 years ago in, in Boston was that, yes, we consider this 14%, but we're talking about an 86% of, uh, of success rate for patients that were uh, practically, practically had access and we compare them to the best medical worlds, boards in the world. So we don't compare the performance of the algorithm to any uh, oncologist who is sitting anywhere in the world, you know, even in a remote and underprivileged area. We are comparing the outcomes of the algorithm versus the best possible healthcare that you can get. And the question is, how many billions of people have access to these top medical boards? So the fact that we are trusting technology and we are allowing it to be an enabler and give us the power is big time democratizing uh, healthcare. It is allowing 
patients that could never imagine having this quality of healthcare um, to make it accessible, uh, accessible for them. The second level of democratization, and especially when it comes to robotics, refers to the patients, because, to the surgeons, because we do see that technology is practically allowing, a, sorry for saying that, a mediocre surgeon to become a good surgeon. So the whole process and the systems and, uh, and, the, and the tools that are given to a, an okay surgeon make them become a better surgeon. So the deviation that is happening at the terms, terms of, in terms of ability of a physician and the deviation that is happening during the case per se with the standardization and the automation that we have is getting smaller. And modern healthcare is big time about eliminating the deviations and trying to make sure that we do the same thing properly as, as, uh, as more frequently as we can. And the second point is that uh, the world, not only the world in general, but the world of healthcare is getting flat. So hospitals that uh, could not imagine competing with the, the big names uh, in the States and in Western Europe are nowadays being enabled uh, with the technology that is allowing them uh, picking the brains of the smartest and the wisest and the ones with a long experience of getting faster to that level of, uh, of performance. So let's see also technology as a democratizing uh, power in terms of health systems, in terms of hospitals, and why not in terms of countries, you know, having, giving this exchange of information and experience uh, worldwide. Um, at the group, and I'm finishing with this, we, we say that we are in the business of life and uh, our, our scope at SoftMedica is uh, making uh, sure that the best technologies and the best therapies from all over the world are being um, accessed and made accessible to the patients in our region. Our friends and customers from Bulgaria are so much uh, grateful and they express this by, by all means because they know that if it hadn't been us, uh, technology like uh, like Da Vinci wouldn't have been uh, available to the Bulgarian patients for 15 years now. For your information, countries like uh, Poland uh, just uh, got access to this technology three years ago. And we've been active and we've been saving lives of patients in uh, Bulgaria, actually enabling surgeons, saving lives of patients for 15 years now. So we take pride in uh, having the vision and the courage to to make disruption, bring the best that is out there in the world and make it available for, uh, for the surgeons in our, in our region. Um, we've been excited and again, we've been proud of dealing with this high-end technology and adding value to these incremental changes and seeing this linear um, uh, development. And from the sneak peek uh, that we get, uh, and uh, the, the gentleman that spoke before, I think we're the absolute experts on talking about that, from the sneak peek that we get about what is following, we don't just get excited, we get fascinated and we can't, uh, we can't wait to see the moment that this exponential um, uh, growth and this exponential um, inflection will happen in, uh, in healthcare by utilizing at uh, max what uh, robotics, uh, AI and uh, machine learning uh, can give us. Thank you very, very much.